And by the way, I forgot to mention about the configuration on isomers. All right. Uh, let's talk a little about the configurational. I, uh, I mean the conformational isomers. So we talk about the conformational isomers. So if in the configurational isomers you have to break a bond in order for one isomer to be the other isomer, here you just have to wait. So meaning, I'll give an example. Let's uh, have this one. This is cyclohexane, of course. It could uh, have a spatial difference that would look, that would make it look like this. And then a spatial difference that could make it look like this. Remember, these are all cyclohexanes, even if you count the number of carbons here. They, these are all cyclohexane, but there is a difference in their bond angles, in the, dif in, in, in the distance of their, their atoms between each other. So, for example, let's compare this. Uh, actually, we have a term for these two conformational isomers of cyclohexane. Here, we have the boat conformation, simply because it looks like a boat. And this, this one looks like a chair. Chair conformation, like this is where your back goes, this is where your butt goes, and this is where your legs go down. Okay, are rested. So, anyway. So, the difference between the boat and the chair conformation is actually the this one and this one this is this one should be the same the only difference is in the boat this part is flipped down in the chair so the distance between this let's go to this carbon first the distance between this and the the carbon i first mentioned is this they're quite near each other as compared to this one the distance is greater so you would say that uh well since again electrons hate each other this one is less stable because the electrons are nearer to each other as compared to the chair that's why that you say that the chair conformation for cyclohexane is the most stable all right and uh, in the chair conformation we actually have uh, names for the bonds so um, let's use blue for the first type of bonds and uh, these are actually the ones the bonds let, let's just fill this with hydrogens the bonds in blue are called the equatorial bonds and uh, I'll draw in red the other type of bond So let's again fill this up with H. These are H shell bonds. So how do we know if a uh, if a if a bond is equatorial or H shell? Well, remember that that the S all these are sp3, and if it's sp3, it's tetrahedral. Or if in real life you find some want to f find something like tetrahedral in shape, get a tripod. So in a tripod we have this stand and then it has three feet, right? Well, we could say that uh, here we have, uh, for example, let's go to this carbon. In this carbon we have two feet already, right? Two feet of the tripod. We have already these two. If you complete the third, if you put the third feet or the third foot, that's the equatorial bond. And if you put the stand, that's the actual bond. Look at this. We have two feet here, right? The third feet would comprise the equatorial bond. And the stand here is the actual bond. Here, it's just like tripod upside down. We have two feet of the tripod here. The third feet would be the equatorial and the stand facing downward this time because it's upside down. It's actual. It's just that that simple just for you to use your imagination uh, just in case you will be asking examinations if if this bond is equator equatorial or actual and uh, well for uh, um for cyclopentane it has a it has the this one this envelope conformation so it could interchange by the way remember these are double headed arrows meaning that from both it could go back to this 
you know, as we call this, piato shape, of course. And uh, it could go back from this to this. So it's reversible. All these are reversible. So again, in conformational isomerism, all you have to do is to wait. At a given time, this will become like this and be and in time it will go back to the other conformation without having to break any bond.